for the last three years, I've been uh, using euphemism and arcane scientific jargon to describe my work. I tell family members that my work and book are about reproductive strategies and neural dimorphisms. Well, it's actually about sex. Why are we so weird about sex? We all do it, and we're not alone in that. Mice, monkeys, even lobsters do it. But we are alone in being intensely private about it and refusing to discuss it with others. And yet, we come up with ready moral definitions of what's good and bad sexual behavior, definitions that are often absurd. So to inject some sanity into this picture, we need to know what average men and women like to think and do sexually. And we now have a tool, a wonderful tool that we all use that lets us do exactly that, and that is the internet. Every single day, more than a billion men and women log on, communicate with each other, communicate with strangers, express their desires, seek out fantasies, and in doing so, give us this unique window into the human psyche. So what do we see when we look into that window? Here's an example. These are searches made by an individual user in America Online. Now, this list of searches was also the beginning of a very strange journey for me. I'm a, I'm a neuroscientist, a computational neuroscientist interested in cognition and perception. We humans are so effortlessly good at certain things that seem uh, we take for granted. We're good at recognizing faces, voices, uh, songs, locating uh, lost keys, uh, navigating impossibly chaotic Indian traffic. And I want to know, as a neuroscientist, how the circuits in the brain generate this astonishingly complex behavior. And that's what I did. I, I went to Boston for graduate school. I created models of uh, human vision and human memory. But then, once I was done, uh, I came across this wonderful new wealth of uh, data, this, these digital footprints of humanity, and that made me realize that human sexuality is also wonderfully complex. It's, it's something much more than we give it credit for. What you see here in the space of, I think, seven or eight searches is desire, temptation, giving into temptation, regret, and a final spiritual search for what this means, what these mysterious desires are. So what does science uh, have to tell us about desires? So, while science has lagged behind, religion and mythology have attempted to address this question of where these mysterious desires come from. According to Hindu mythology, desire and the god of desire, Kama, were created when Brahma, the creator of all gods, uh, created another being, Sandhya, who was so beautiful, she had the most exceedingly handsome features, and he was so taken by her and so aroused that in the moment of arousal, he gave birth to Kama, the god. After overcoming his initial surprise, he entrusted Kama with the task of captivating men and women to further the eternal task of creation. In a later incarnation, Kama then goes on to marry Maya, the goddess of illusion. So in our mythology, we had this notion, this uh, acceptance of desire as part of the natural fabric of life. But this, this acceptance came without a true understanding. What do we, where do these desires come from? And Hindu mythology didn't go all the way. It still thought that female sexuality was wicked and dangerous. My, my colleague, Ogi Yogis and I, he's back in Boston. We decided to take a statistical approach uh, to understanding desire. So we compiled the largest data set ever analyzed about sexual desire. We analyzed a billion web searches, the, mil the content of the million most popular websites on the internet, millions of erotic videos, millions of erotic stories, tens of thousands of digitized uh, novels, tens of uh, millions of online personal ads, and much more, to sculpt a fine-grained, high-resolution landscape of human sexuality. So what does this landscape tell us? What, is, what, are, what are male fantasies like, and what are female fantasies like? Well, it turns out that men want to watch two-minute porn videos, and women want to watch, uh, read 250-page romance novels. Now you're thinking, did we really need to do all that research to come up with... <laughs> Uh, what is an obvious conclusion? True, fair enough, but it was interesting research. But the, the truly interesting parts are in the finer details. So men, it turns out, are very simple and visual, and their fantasies are focused on specific body parts and body shapes. Now, women are uh, quite visual as well. We analyzed the content of more than 10,000 romance novels and extracted the average description of the hero. The perfect hero boasts blue eyes, a straight nose, high forehead, and square jaw, together making a handsome face. His head is framed by dark hair, which accents the white teeth and essential mouth, curved into a crooked smile. 
He stands tall with broad shoulders, a broad chest, narrow waist, flat stomach, strong arms, big hands, big feet, and long legs. Though the heroine's eyes might ultimately be drawn to his powerful thighs. So now you know what women mean when they say they want a nice guy. <laughs> While women are quite focused on the visual, they're not singularly focused on the visual like men are. We, female fantasies are much more complex and explore the inner life of the male and female protagonists, and they do care who the, the guy is. Psychologists Marianne Fisher and Tammy Meredith compiled uh, a list of the most popular uh, prof uh, professions of male uh, protagonists in romance novels. They did so by analyzing the titles of 15,000 Harlequin romance novels. Here's that list. What you do not see on this list is IT consultants and <laughs> bank managers. Why is it that uh, male and female fantasies are so absurdly, profoundly different? How do we even find a common ground when we seem to be at two ends of the spectrum, the whole Mars and Venus thing? Well, evolutionary theory has an answer to that. Uh, according to this theory, uh, the sexual encounter differs in cost and benefits for men and women. The theory goes that sex was historically associated with childbirth for women, and they had to be selective and choose providers and protectors. Men, not having the cost, not incurring that cost, could go on and procreate with as many women, as many fertile women as possible. And incidentally, the body parts that feature heavily in male fantasies and male erotica, that's breasts, rumps, and feet, are also excellent biological indicators of fertility. There's a very messy go-between that connects these desires uh, with these supposed evolutionary strategies, and that's our brain. How do the circuits in our brain come, uh, give life and shape to these supposed strategies uh, and create these desires that we all experience and feel? And to understand this, uh, I wish that we could put uh, people, men and women, in brain scanners while they read, uh, read romance novels and watch porn, but we can't do that. It's very tough to get funding for such research. So we must look elsewhere for clues, and those clues come from a very unexpected place. That's gay pornography. Homosexuality is, of course, an interest in members of the same sex. So does that mean that when gay men are interested in other men, are their sexual brains behaving like the sexual brains of women? That's the common perception, but it turns out that it's completely untrue. Straight male desire and gay male desire are virtually identical and parallel in the specifics. Every genre of gay pornography has a parallel genre in straight pornography. For instance, one of the most popular genres uh, and fantasies that men have in, are about young women or teens, which is paralleled by interest in gay men in young men who they call twinks. This is another popular interest that men have, which, is, which surprises a lot of people. One of the popular uh, genres of straight porn uh, is an interest in overweight women who are called BBWs, or Big Beautiful uh, Women. And this, again, is paralleled by an interest in, uh, by gay men in overweight men who are called bears. Now, both gay men and straight men have fantasies of being cheated on. So that's not uh, of cheating, but these are fantasies of being cheated on. Women do not have any such fantasies. Now, this is possibly the result of an ancient uh, adaptation called sperm competition. Uh, our more promiscuous primate ancestors, like chimps, often mated with multiple partners within a short period of time. And because of that, the chimp brain evolved to have this mechanism that uh, produced more sperm in the presence of more competitors. The idea was that you had to outcompete by producing more and increase your chances. And it turns out that our brains might have these ancient inherited instincts, and these desires are a result of the brain acting on those. Now, here's one that should surprise many and perhaps relieve many as well, penises. Both gay men and straight men are obsessed with penises. They consciously and unconsciously seek out penises in erotica. The word penis or its synonyms do not feature among the top 100 physical uh, descriptors used in romance novels or female erotica. This, again, is possibly the result of an inherited mechanism we have, uh, again, coming from our primate ancestors, who used to display uh, erections as uh, aggressive displays. And sure enough, when you put people in scanners when they were uh, viewing penises, and this was not done in the, uh, with erotica in mind, you see that the, the regions in their brain that light up are also regions that are implicated in the processing of social cues and social emotions. So millions of men and women are also now using the internet and turning to the internet to craft, create, and share their own erotica, and in the process, take their desires to very unexpected and perhaps uh, seemingly perverse places. 
Furunari and fan fiction are examples of erotica which are created by amateurs. Furunari uh, d displays slender women with big busts and bigger penises. Fan fiction uh, refers to stories, amateur erotic stories created again by straight uh, women which pair together two very popular male dominant characters from popular fiction and they write stories where these two characters, purportedly straight characters, explore each other's uh, bodies and inner feelings. And they do this to a great extent and have intense discussions around this. So it turns out that our desires, no matter how perplexing they may seem, actually seem to come from the brain, with the brain tapping into these ancient inherited mechanisms and combining them. Kama, the god of desire, happens to reside in our brain and captivates us with a dazzling array of endless illusions. Millions of men and women who think they're alone in their desires, which they perceive as deviant or abnormal, should know that there are many millions of others who share the same desires. So we must script a new chapter in our morality. Sexual desire is the force behind a lot of art, commerce, literature. And if we understand these desires well, we can harness them rather than uh, think of them as mysterious and feel compelled by them. And finally, I hope that we are heading into a future where I can describe this work and explore the deeper meaning of all this without using euphemisms. Thank you. Thank you.